Welcome to the MacArthur Memorial Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Williams. Join me as we explore the life and legacy of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and discuss a wide range of military history topics from the American Civil War to the Korean War. Welcome, everyone. My name is Amanda Williams, and I'm here with Jim Zobel, and we are both historians here at the MacArthur Memorial. And today we have another topic for discussion. Now, when you think about battles in the Pacific War, you tend to think of maybe Guadalcanal, Okinawa, Leyte, Midway, Leyte Gulf. It was a very, very long and difficult war. There are many, many battles on land and at sea. And one of the lesser known battles, though, is the Battle of Moratai, which began on September 15th, 1945. Now, Moratai, 44. Yeah. Oh, I already got it wrong. September 15th, <laughs> 1944. So Moratai is a small island in what is now Indonesia, southeast of the Philippines. And prior to World War II, um, it was part of the Netherlands East Indies. It was occupied in 1942 by the Japanese. And today we're going to discuss that 1944 Battle of Moratai and its role in the liberation of the Philippines. So first we're going to get oriented, though. So, Jim, what is happening in the Pacific in the summer of 1940? And what are MacArthur's moves leading up to September 1944? Well, like we discussed last time in July, they had the Pearl Harbor Conference. And that was right at the end of July. So you basically got August until they hit that time for more time. And so everybody's still figuring out, are we going to go to Philippines? Are we going to go to Formosa? So the Joint Chiefs of Staff are doing that. Um, MacArthur is still following that strategy that was laid down in those Reno 4 operations. <clears throat> so by July, they've taken that vocal cop peninsula, which is all the way at the western end of New Guinea. And the next jump is to the Halmahera Islands, because that's like the midway point between western New Guinea and Mindanao, which is where they're going. Mindanao is the southernmost island of the Philippines and one of the biggest outside of Luzon. And that's where they were planning on going into in November. So they needed that base at Mortai to be able to base all those land-based air power. You know, because that's the way they've done it all the way up through New Guinea. And then have that will be, you know, the will provide that air cover umbrella to be able to move, then move into uh, southern Mindanao. So that's the plan for it. Nimitz, at the same time, he's, his forces, 1st Marine Division, is getting ready to go to the Blaus, Peleliu, mm-hmm. you know, which will turn into such a, a right. bloodbath, and as well, Yap. And so right around that mid-September region is when you'll have the forces getting ready to go to the Palau's, MacArthur's forces are getting ready to go to Moratai. In early September, um, Halsey will start doing those overflights with the Third Fleet, and that'll be the first time they hit the Philippines. And so that's where uh, in September, early September 8th, 9th, when those airplanes first started hitting the Philippines again, which causes such a you know, a fear mm-hmm. amongst the Japanese as well as all the people that are still um, right. there in the Philippines. So that's basically what's going on. They're waiting to get that final delineation of where everyone's going, but they're carrying out the operations that they already had planned up to that point. When, and I think you've already answered why to an extent, but when when is the okay given, let's go to Moratai? Well, they, you know, they were looking at, at the Halmaharas um, and Moratai, is the northernmost island. Mm-hmm. And because they had broken those codes in the year before, they knew through code breaking that you've got about 30,000 men of the Japanese Second Army that are on Homa Era, which mm-hmm. is the bigger island of that. Was of it that just, group. was it just infantry or did the Japanese? Yeah, have mostly. I mean, they have, they have air power there, but when MacArthur's forces took Biak and then Nomenfor and San Support, they've able, they've got the air power there that they can neutralize okay. all those air bases on Hamahera. They're not hitting Moratai or anything like that, but they're taking out, um, all that air power there. And also, um, when Halsey does those flights, he'll have some, you know, air power that'll hit those Hamahera, you know, islands, making sure that that's all suppressed. And, but the thing is, is, uh, it's a major staging base whenever the Japanese would put out Troops to go into New Guinea and whatnot. They went it was, through there. They went through the home of Harris. Okay. Yeah, they go the Philippines through there. And so the Japanese do want to hold that, but they don't put a lot of people into Mortai. They don't mm-hmm. do a lot of defenses there. And because of code breaking, they know that. So they know that there's only about a thousand Japanese on that island. 
and they can probably take that real quick, which is what MacArthur always wants to do, you know, go to the weakest spot. And because right. you've got code breaking, you know, it can tell you exactly yeah. where to go. So that's why they pick uh, the island of Mortai, because they have some some good landing beaches on the south of the island of what they call the Pitoe or Pito Bay. Um, I'm not sure how they, they pronounce it. And whereas on Hamaher, there's really no good landing. And so that it kind of fits the scale of what they want to do as, as well. It follows the, the same pattern that they've been doing all along. So how does the battle begin? Who are the major commanders involved and what troops are doing the fighting? Well, they, they, they're going to use about 61,000 troops, but I think like two thirds of them are like engineers, service troops, people mm-hmm. that can build airstrips. And so they, you know, they think there's about a thousand people there. They've got, um, the, the Dixie Division, which is the 31st Infantry Division. That's mm-hmm. under Major General John Persons. And he'll be the main group. They'll have the, uh, 126th RCT Re- Regimental Combat Team, which comes from the 32nd Division. Charles Hall, who runs the 11th Corps, um, he runs, you know, the 31st Division under them. And so he'll be in control of it. Uh, Dan Barbie, of course, is going to run the amphibious forces. Um, James Sprague has this task force 78 from the Central Pacific, which will provide those Jeep carriers, which will cover that whole area when they do that. They'll go in relatively unmatched. You know, I mean, you're dumping 20 some thousand people in there in the Japanese. I, th- I think they said they saw two. I mean, they, okay. they, they kill hundreds, um, mainly because after they, they kind of take the island. The Japanese try to do a, a lift of all the people left on the island to move them to home here. And they, they use barge traffic to okay. do that. And yeah. when they did that, the American PD boats went in there just and just wiped them out, right. you know? And so I think by October 4th, um, you know, the, the, the Japanese are, are okay. basically done and they do what they did on, on Bougainville where they didn't take the whole island. They just took a little area of it and then ringed it off with like defense network to keep the Japanese away. And that's what they'll do here. They'll, they'll use that Southern part of, of Mortai, build all these air bases there Mm -hmm. and, and then not worry about the, the rest. They'll set up a defensive perimeter after that. But the the Japanese will try to, you know, keep sending barge traffic in there with, with, uh, nuisance troops, but they, they do patrolling every day. And so Mm -hmm. they're, they're wiping out these people as, as they can, you know, American troops, Completely? Yeah. Or they, they're yeah, not using yeah, any Australian? Yeah, no, not, or, not okay. on this one. They've, they've been um, put into the air, because once they hit into Netherlands, East Indies, mm-hmm. and uh, they've leave, left those Australian-mandated territories, MacArthur's using all American troops okay. you know, after that. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so we know MacArthur goes ashore. There's pictures of yeah. him, and then there's pictures of him walking around. So when does he go ashore, and what are his experiences? Well, that day is the 15th. So the first day. They, yeah, they, he rides the Nashville, which we've done the film on, the, the light cruiser under, under Commander Coney. And they go witness the bombardment at Galea, which is on, at, on Halmahera. And then the ship brings them to that Pitoe area. And mm-hmm. MacArthur goes ashore with, with Barbie, with Hall, with Persons. Mm-hmm. Um, they go in at, at about 11 o'clock. And it's, it's funny because, you see all the pictures of MacArthur going ashore at Leyte, right. and you know they said he was he was mad because the you know the, the landing craft got stuck on a sandbar and he had to walk through mm-hmm. the water. But at Mortai, he's up to his armpits. You know, right. I mean, it's yeah, like you see the it's yeah, of them. it's like these mud flats. Yeah. You know that they go in, and, and uh, that was the biggest problem. All the trucks, all the you know everything got stuck in the mud, and they had to set up winches everywhere to haul everything out. But MacArthur goes ashore, and and he's walking around. You can see he's stained, you know, from the armpits down. But he takes some of the best pictures there because he takes them with the troops, right? And yeah. you know we have all those photos of him with all the thirty first division guys and you really don't you don't see that in any other um time during the war where he poses with all the the mm-hmm. soldiers there and it, it it provides one of the you know the, the best shots of him. but he's there for a couple hours and and somebody heard him say that one step away from the philippines you know and they're waiting for me there and then he got that look you know as he yeah. looked off <laughs> far into the distance you know like like he could see the philippines you know from 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 so, war time well that that brings up The next question then, because when he goes back on the Nashville, um, a message comes from the combined chiefs who are having a meeting in Quebec and they are asking, can MacArthur go to Leyte soon, quickly? 
and he, the Nashville's operating under radio silence, so MacArthur can see the message, but he can't respond to it. His chief of staff, Sutherland, in Hollandia, sees it, will respond, yes, we can do this. And there are people that say that causes some friction between yeah. the two. Yeah. Tell us about this story and, and what happens next. Well, because of Halsey doing those overflights, he makes the wrong assumption that Japanese air power is, is wiped out. And so rather than he wants to scrap the Mindanao operation, go directly into Leyte, which is north of Mindanao. And he wants to scrap the Palau invasion as well as the Yap invasion and dedicate all those troops to going to Leyte. Um, the ch- troops for going to Peleliu are already on the ocean. Mm-hmm. And Nimitz and MacArthur both say, no, that's got to go because that's going to support Right. You know, going into that to the Philippines, uh, which is you know the worst decision they make because the first division just gets hammered, you know, at Peleliu. Um, But when that message goes to the Joint Chiefs, that really shakes them all up, you know, because they're still deciding what to do, mm-hmm. and that makes the decision mm-hmm. um, that we'll go into Leyte right now. So and, when when Sutherland sends a message, yes, this yeah. is possible, they decide. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like over a three day period they're mm-hmm. doing these this message traffic between headquarters and Sutherland's, you know, the only one that can answer because MacArthur, like you said, is under that radio silence. Mm-hmm. And so he gets together with like Kinney and the other chiefs there right. that are all at Hollandia. See, it had been weird before they went on this because Sutherland was at Hollandia mm-hmm. commanding the forward operating base coming there. MacArthur was in Brisbane uh, right. back in Australia and his deputy chief of staff, who's Richard J. Marshall, he's in Washington with this conference, you know, there. Okay. And, and so it's kind of like this command setup that, you know, should be very easy, but Sutherland by this point is believing he's in control of everything, mm-hmm. you know, which we talked about in, in the yeah. Hollandia one that we did. Uh, and so when MacArthur gets back, you know, this is everything he's wanted. Right. Everybody knows they want to do. Sutherland made the the best decision he could, right. but there's all these other matters going on with yeah. MacArthur and Sutherland because of Sutherland's girlfriend right. who he brought to Hollandia. MacArthur had ordered her out of there. Sutherland doesn't think that MacArthur has any business telling him about you know girlfriends or anything like right. that. And they get in this big shouting match when they get back. But the thing is, is like when MacArthur gets back, he's cool. Nobody sees any problem. He's happy as all get out when they have the meeting. Cause he's like, let's go to Leyte. We'll go to Luzon at the same time. They have this mm-hmm. meeting and all the chiefs are like, you can't do that. And he's like, all right, we're not going to do that. You know, and, and everybody's like, oh, wow, he's greatly happy, you know, yeah. but then MacArthur goes to Weldon Dusty Rhodes, who's the pilot mm-hmm. who's supposed to take off the next day to go back to Australia. And MacArthur goes to him, doesn't tell him you wait a day and Rhodes, why? What's going on, you know? And the next morning, MacArthur calls in Sutherland. See, Sutherland had breathed a sigh of relief because he thought everything was over. <laughs> and MacArthur brings in, and, and then it's just, Whoa. you know, they, they said MacArthur knew every four-letter word in the book, you know, like like at Leyte later on, because right. they get in this big shouting match, you know, over it. And it's, you know, it's, it is that delineation of I will make operational decisions, mm-hmm. you know, even though it was like, you know, that's what I wanted to do. But I think it's all this other stuff, yeah. you know, and besides Paul Rogers, who's Sutherland's chief warrant officer, he got brought off Corregidor by Sutherland mm-hmm. and put on the PT votes. He's all the way up there. And when he's at Hollandia, he says that he hears uh, Sutherland standing at the window of this complex overlooking all of Hollandia going, the old man's had it. I'm in charge now. And Sutherland, yeah. and yeah. Rogers tells Egerberg and Larabas that, the they two main aides of MacArthur. And, yeah. and so uh, that definitely gets brought up, you know. Now, do they tell him that part about, about what Rogers says? You know, people always talk about, um, you know, this, all these people that, you know, have these thoughts against MacArthur and never express them, but they put them in writing, you know, to like loved ones and whatnot. You know, do you think MacArthur's, getting word of what's going in these letters, you know, and some of these things, you know, is that why he's against Eichelberger? Is that why he knows Sutherland is like, yeah. you know, really pushing the the boundaries. And so MacArthur's going to set it straight right there. I'm in control. And so that's kind of why they, they have this, this, you know, opening up in this big fight at, at Hollandia, you know, mm-hmm. after things, everything MacArthur wanted, but yeah. MacArthur just sees Sutherland as, you know, 
getting beyond his time. And Sutherland's asking for to be relieved, to be given a command, to be sent to Europe, mm-hmm. somewhere else. And MacArthur's like, no, you're going to do your duty and you're going to sit here and I'm going to ride you the, the whole time. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that has always been weird, but I guess it was, there's the element of it was personal. Yeah. You know, I mean, Sutherland does what MacArthur wanted to do, essentially. He says, yes. Yeah. That gives them eventually that green light to go back and do what MacArthur wanted to do, but it was not your place. Yeah. It's, I guess, the bottom line. And, uh, you know, if, if there hadn't been all that other stuff, you know, would that have, would that have come to, you know, light? Would, would MacArthur have know admonished him as much like that i don't i don't know yeah i don't know it's one of those what if questions but it it definitely damaged the relationship oh for good Um, yeah it's it's over between them yeah all right so going back to the battle of moratai then wrap it up for us so you said the japanese they don't really make much of an effort to retake it yeah they can't you said nuisance troops yeah and and things like that so then how does it kind of officially when does it end well they they call it over on october 4th which it really is because i think they reached the objectives they needed that first day you know there there was like i said the the troops the japanese troops there weren't going to be able to do anything they pretty much went to the jungle and tried to try to make it off the island uh the thing is, is that when, when you take Mortai, you've breached that Philippines, Netherlands, East Indies line. Mm-hmm. And now, um, your planes are able to reach Borneo and those oil, you know, facilities. They'll start bombing those. Um, they'll have control of those seas between the Netherlands, East Indies, as well as, um, the Philippines, you know, because mm-hmm. they'll have control of that area. So it is a very, it's a big stroke, you know, to be able right. to take this. And during the, the operation they you know they had wanted more to cover that land base air cover over Mindanao, but when they go to Leyte, they're not going to have it. Right, it's too far. Yeah, more time will be able to take care of the airplanes on Mindanao, um, and they will do a big part in that. But yeah. but now you're going to go in to Leyte with no land base air cover, and the Japanese have a great amount of planes left. Right. Out. Yeah, so right. so that's when it all gets you know thrown on the navy and causes all those tr- troubles when mm-hmm. they get there. Yeah. yeah. Um. Casualties from the battle. I think they lost thirty-one people. Okay. Yeah, and the Japanese were, were, were you know, as usual, wiped out. Right. Yeah. Okay. So pretty limited. Yeah, I mean that that it was the code breaking will help them a lot in the Philippines, uh, but not like this. Mm-hmm. You know, to be saying no, let's go to this one because there's thirty thousand over the, over there. Right. And that's the way it had played out through New Guinea. That code breaking was able to send them where they could, you know, make a good. Yeah. Good, good wash against fewer troops. Would you, know? would you say Moratai then is like the last, what we would consider traditional island hopping hop? Yeah, in, in MacArthur's yeah, theater. Yeah, the Philippines I, yeah. isn't that. Right. I mean, they go to the different islands there, but it's pretty much yeah. known where they're going to, yeah. where they're going to go. And I mean, they are, they are hopping from islands, you know, but it's not really like bypassing. And I guess the rivers. Philippines has POW camps or a big city like Manila that is a, target yeah. that you can't hop over because you want it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, how do historians view the Battle of Moratai, and was it essential to taking the Philippines? Well, like I said, it, it is a very big um, strategic move, mm-hmm. and it will help, you know, as far as suppressing all that air power on, on Mindanao during that late day campaign, right. which is important, and it will, you know, con- Give them control of those, those seas south of the Philippines. You know, they'll eventually, by taking the Philippines, be able to cut off Japan from mm-hmm. the Netherlands, East Indies. But, but that gives it a big, a big headway right there. So it, for the, for the amount that they put into it, what they got out of it was, was way more than, than mm-hmm. they thought. You know, it just, it was, didn't become the hub of controlling that invasion into Mindanao. The funny thing though is, is like Biak. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> When they go into these places, all the, the islanders are like, don't go over there. Don't go to that area. That's where all the bad spirits live. And the, all the, you know, the engineers are like, shut up, you know, get out of here. And then they go over there and they all get typhus or they all get like, um, you know, you know, yeah. and like that. You don't go there sure because happens. it's a, it's a, it's a disease spot. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah there are bad spirits there, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, funny how that happens. Yeah. Um, so historians, I guess, view it as a successful operation mm-hmm. and not a controversial, you know, may not have done exactly what they yeah. intended it initially, but the plans changed and it then was still helpful. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Any final thoughts about Moratai? No. I think they, you know, they have a statue of MacArthur there now. Um, and, and so it was seven statues in seven different countries. So now it's eight, mm. eight statues in eight different countries. His legacy's all over. Very much so. Mm. Are you going to Moratai? I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. If anyone would like to invite us there. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, for sharing your knowledge with us as always. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.